concentrations. So um, what do I mean when I say stress concentration? This is working. Uh, That is, <laughs> that is a good one. Um, so the, the general question is, if I have some sort of a discontinuity in the material, if I have a hole in a plate, so say I take some plate with some stress being applied to it, and then punch some random shaped hole in the middle of it. So let's call this a hole. And I look now at the stress at the midplane of the sample. What's going to happen to it? So if I, let's draw a couple potential examples. Uh, something like this. This is supposed to look like the same hole. Now cut open at the midplane. So if I say this is some sigma naught, is there maybe a uniform stress? No. Is there a decreasing stress near the hole? Is there an increasing <coughs> stress near that hole? So, um, to gauge your intuition really quick, and just to get you maybe thinking about it a little bit more, I'm going to have a pole everywhere thing on this. So, as a heads up to get that ready. So the, the question then is, for these three for these three, um, if, I, if I cut a hole in a plate, I look at the stress now around that hole, what does the stress profile look like at different parts along here? may be fairly intuitive, but just as a double check to, to make sure you're all awake. Okay. Let's jump back. Cool. So, um, this is good. Generally, yes, everyone's intuition is, is correct here with the caveat that I didn't actually specify which stress, but generally the way that I had written it, we're looking at, um, do, 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 pops back up again. Yep. The stress still in that direction. So if I'm applying a stress in this direction, um, a, and I cut a hole in a material, the stress near that hole in this direction is going to increase. So the question then is, is how much does it increase and how much does it increase for a specific shape or how does that, how does that increase change for a given shape? So I'm going to define a constant now, K, our, our stress concentration constant. So uh, stress concentration factor K is equal to sigma max over sigma applied. Where here, missing things, um, here basically I'm saying if this is actually our correct case, well, let's not erase things with the cap on again, um, if this is actually our correct case, how, how much does this thing increase by here near the hole? Um, and so 
that will quantify with this stress factor K here. And so we're looking at that ratio of our, our far field applied stress to the local stress. So before I get into all of this, there, there's an example that I'm going to show you, which is kind of the, the typical example of stress concentrations, and that's a, a circular hole in a semi-infinite plate. But before, oh, before we get into that, I'm going to define polar stress coordinates. Did you guys see polar stress coordinates or stress in, in polar coordinates in 220 or anywhere else? No? Maybe. Okay. Okay. So you've, you've probably seen polar coordinates in general in math courses. You may or may not have seen polar coordinates in, in, in the terms of stress. Um, so I'm going to define really quick polar stress coordinates. So for this, um, I have some arbitrary body with some point zero um, and I want to look at now the stress at some distance away from this point zero. Um, I can draw a little box here. This is a very big box actually. but uh, And I can define now stress in this box away from that point zero as the stress here is some radial stress, sigma RR. The stress, so the, the stress along the direction away from the point, um, the stress tangent to the direction, I'm going to call it sigma theta theta, and in <coughs> shear here, uh, this is going to be a sigma R theta. R theta, where this is, um, let's draw this again. Uh, some point O, this is now for some direction R at some angle theta away from the horizontal. So um, your general stress coordinates, if you remember, maybe stress, con or stress transformations, R is x squared plus y squared, theta is inverse tangent of y over x for general polar to Cartesian uh, coordinate transformation. For stress transformation, this is a little bit different. It's a little bit more complicated. So, in general, for this, you can do that. i to come up with a better way to continue onto a new sheet. Um, so, in general, for this, the, the transformation is this kind of ugly long function, uh, but it'll be useful. Sigma RR now in terms of our original the normal Cartesian stress, sigma XY and, and shear. Uh, this is sigma XX cosine squared of theta sigma YY sine squared of theta plus 2XY sine theta cosine theta 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 x sine squared y cosine squared oh, minus 2 sine cosine sigma r theta is sigma y So this is the general relationship between stress in polar coordinates and stress in Cartesian coordinates. Um, this is particularly useful for the lab that you'll be doing this week um, because it turns out when we have a circular hole, it's easy to look at stress in terms of polar coordinates, the circular coordinates, just makes things a little bit easier. In the example today, I'll show I'll go through polar coordinates, or I'll, I'll show the stress in terms of polar coordinates. 
So to give you an example of kind of how this translates to a simple stress state, so if I look at just um, uniaxial, uniaxial stress, I can write things. Uh, now if I have, again, some sigma naught, now with an x and a y direction here. Um, I know my sigma x is just sigma naught, sigma y and sigma xy are both zero in the body given this coordinate system. I can take these and plug them into my relationships up here and say now uh, my sigma r is equal to sigma naught cosine squared of theta. I'm going to rewrite this using a, a double angle theorem identity, um, which is one half sigma naught one plus cosine of two theta. Um, theta theta sigma naught sine squared of theta, which is also one half one minus cosine of two theta and r theta, I'm just going to straight go to the double angle theorem, uh, one half sigma naught sine of two theta. So even for kind of a simple stress state like this, the polar coordinates are a little bit maybe not non-intuitive, the equations for them. Um, but basically you can imagine here for this, for this two theta, uh, if I go zero or 180, I'm getting the same stress and it kind of changes uniformly along there. So RR, when I'm looking kind of in the vertical direction is zero because there's no stress then in the vertical direction. So when theta is, uh, when theta is 90 degrees, um, when it's back to 180, then I'm getting the same stress again. Um, so it kind of goes in a circle. But these, it turns out, are kind of a useful starting point for the next thing we're going to talk about, which is a hole in a plate. So what happens now when I take this uniform plate um, and I punch a hole in it? Let's jump to this. Talk now of a hole in a plate. So, my starting point, let's define our system here. I have a hole, I have a plate now, that same uniaxial loading condition. Um, some, I'm going to call this sigma infinity. So, uh, let's, let's slightly redraw this. Um, so here now, this is, I'm going to make these wiggly lines and probably keep it the same. Uh, what I'm trying to show here is, let's call this a semi So basically the, the size of the plate now here, if this is some hole with radius A in the middle, the size of the plate of plate is much larger than that hole that's inside it. So this is like a, a maybe, a, I don't know, you could say in a, in a sheet, this is maybe a hole punch size hole in a, in a A4 paper, but the, the size of the hole is like <coughs> at least 10 times smaller than the overall size of the plate. Um, for this now, I can say the far field stress, so, so now I, I want to find what the stress distribution here at the center of the hole is, or here, at the, here around the hole is. Far field distribution of stress I can say my sigma r, I'm going to rewrite these, sigma rr is one half 
sigma naught one plus cosine of two theta, sigma theta theta, one half sigma naught one minus cosine two theta, sigma r theta is negative one half sigma naught sine of two theta. So this is my far field at now some distance at some distance r is much further than a. So at r is, r is infinity, we go back to our normal solution. But I want to figure out what the stress at that hole is. So I can draw now, if I, if I zoom in on that hole, this is again some radius a. I know that at the edge of the hole, at the surface, I can't have a stress in the r direction because there's nothing there to pull on. So because of this free boundary, I can't have a stress in the r direction. Similarly, I can't have a shear along the surface of that plate. Sigma r theta is also zero. But I can be pulling along the side of that plate. So I know sigma theta theta is something. So the question then is what is that something? So there's a way to get generally to this solution that I'm not going to show you because it's a little bit complicated, but it involves something known as the airy stress function. Um, in your lab manual, I have a link to, uh, there's a book, again, by, by a, a guy named Stephen Timoshenko, which you may recognize that Timoshenko name. Basically, he was a, a Russian mechanical engineer who solved all of the solid mechanics problems uh, in like the 40s and 50s. So, um, but there's, there's a book by him called Theory of Elasticity, where he, he's comes, he shows really nicely the, the derivation of the solution. But, um, and I'll, I'll ha I have a link to it in the lab manual. But the, basically what we end up with, there's a big general solution that we can get for r, uh, r theta and theta theta, which I'll show in a minute. But the important one ends up being the stress at the edge of the hole. So kind of intuitively, the stress increases near the hole. Um, and at, at the edge of the hole, that's where the stress concentration is highest because that's where the material is missing. So we end up with our stress concentration at the hole is sigma naught one minus two cosine of two theta. So this is at r is equal to a. What that means now, if we start looking along the surface of the hole, Theta is zero, theta is 90. Um, when I start plugging stuff in here, so if I plug in now, remember there's a far field stress sigma naught somewhere far away here. If I want to look at the stress here at the edge, at the leading edge of the hole, and I plug in theta is equal to zero, theta is equal to zero goes to one, this one minus two, this is actually a negative sigma naught. So now that's the stress um, in this direction. So here I'm actually getting a compressive stress at the edge of this hole in the y direction, where remember for, for a normal plate, nope, for for a normal plate without a hole in it, there shouldn't be any stress in that y direction. So there shouldn't be any compressive stress. There's a compressive strain because of Poisson's ratio expansion. But now we're actually getting a stress because of that stress concentration at the hole. Um, here at this top edge, if I plug in 90 degrees, goes on of 180 minus one, one minus one minus minus two is plus three. So I end up with here at the top of the hole, this is actually a three sigma. 
So now this is sort of actually the best case scenario. Um, and I'll show in a minute uh, what happened, or maybe toward the end of lecture what happens when you get an elongated hole. But you actually end up with, if you remember that, that stress concentration factor K um, is actually now three at the top of the hole. So <coughs> if I have a circular hole in a plate, which is very common for engineered structures because we need to connect things generally. So if you punch a hole for, uh, for a screw or for a rivet, that is automatically going to increase the stress concentration near that hole by a factor of three, um, which is pretty considerable and not necessarily ideal uh, if you want to be connecting things with rivets. So um, here that K is three. The, the full field solution, so this is now just the stress here around this side. Um, if I plug in on the other side, uh, this is symmetric. This ends up also being three sigma, and this ends up being compressive negative sigma. Um, yeah. So does the value of A not matter for the concentration? In this case, yeah. It actually doesn't. But this is, again, assuming that the size of the plate is much larger than A. So this is why I'm calling this a semi-infinite thing. The, if, if your size of the plate gets small relative to the size of the hole, then it basically, you get extra stress concentration factors. Uh, and there's a way to do that that I'm, I'll probably try to talk about on Wednesday. Um, yeah, but so, yeah, in, in, in a semi-infinite plate case, this A doesn't actually matter interestingly. But if it's not perfectly circular, the aspect ratio of it matters, which I'll show toward the end of today. So uh, the full field solution is kind of a little bit gross. Uh, and it makes it more gross because it's in polar coordinates, so it's maybe not necessarily intuitive. But I'm going to show it to you. Uh, you don't necessarily need to have it memorized, but I'll show kind of what, it, what the implications are for the stress concentrations. Um, so the full field solution we can pull out uh, is at any arbitrary position now r around the hole other than in the circle. So r is greater than a, greater than or equal to a, um, and at any position, uh, any theta. This is now some sigma naught over 2. This is a 1 minus a squared over r squared plus 1 plus 3a to the 4th over r to the 4th minus 4a squared over r squared. Cosine of 2 theta. Close this off. Theta, theta. Sigma naught over 2. Um, 1 plus a squared over r squared minus 1 minus 3a to the 4th over r to the 4th cosine of 2 theta sigma r theta minus sigma naught over 2 1 minus 3a to the 4th r to the 4th 2a squared over r squared sine of theta. Okay, so this is the general far field solution for the stress distribution around a hole in a plate. So somewhere in, oh, let's see if we can actually pull it up if my mouse wants to work. I'll pull up in a minute the what that stress distribution looks like or what that strain distribution looks like. I had written a MATLAB code for it yesterday. But um, so the one that we're really interested in, um, again remember that the the so this now this <laughs> theta theta we're also um, is also known as a as a hoop 
stress. So if you can imagine basically if I if I'm looking at now the stress in a body um, around the circle, the theta theta is always kind of acting out like this. Pulling out this way. So it's known I think yeah, I guess it's still technically it's 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 the hoop stress because it's kind of pulling on that ring around um, your point O. So when I say hoop stress, I'm talking about my sigma theta theta. Um, so there's a couple directions that we're interested in looking at now. So one is the stress sigma theta theta, the hoop stress um, at my line theta is equal to zero. So if you remember, I just showed here at that theta is equal to zero line, um, I'm getting a negative sigma naught here at the, at the root of the hole. But what does it look like everywhere else in the sample? So if I plug in my theta is equal to zero there, I can rewrite this. This is now sigma naught uh, a squared over r squared, 2r squared, minus 3 a to the fourth over 2 r to the fourth. Um, and so what this looks like now, if I pull on this guy, This is the stress along this zero line. Um, so the stress here at some point is minus sigma naught, or minus sigma infinity, I guess, depending on which notation I'm using, which I keep mixing up. Um, let's just go with sigma naught, because I am going to keep defaulting to that in my head anyway. Um, so I get a minus sigma naught here. As I go further away, as this r increases, this has an r squared and r to the fourth on the bottom, so this is going to kind of quadratically go to zero. So it's going to kind of go up to zero there. So as I go further away from the center of this hole, it's going to be here minus sigma naught at zero, or at, at r equals a, and then it's going to kind of decay to zero pretty quickly because of this r squared and this r to the fourth on the bottom. Um, if I look now sigma theta theta in the vertical direction, this one, theta theta at, this is equal to 90 degrees, this is sigma naught, 1 plus a squared over 2r squared. 3a to the 4th over 2r to the 4th. If I plug things into my equation up here, if I move it up higher, um, and what this now looks like for a far field stress. We're looking at the stress along this line here. Um, so here I can say now there's some positive three sigma naught. Um, and this, as I go to large r's, this r to the fourth and this r to the squared, these terms will go to zero. Uh, and so I'll end up with a sigma one. So this, at some distance far away, decays to decays to sigma naught, um, and then close to the hole it's a, it's a three sigma. So exactly how fast it decays is sort of interesting to look at. So I know for this guy at my r is equal to a, my hoop stress is 
3 sigma at r is equal to 2a. So now this is 2 whole radii away from the center. Um, my hoop stress decays down to 1.45 sigma naught um, at 3a. This goes down to 1.11 sigma naught, um, and at 4a, this goes down to 1.07 sigma naught. So it decays down pretty quickly. So now you can see, even if I'm just one whole radius away, this is already down almost near what it should be at the for, for far field stresses. So along with your lab, let's see if I can make MATLAB work. Let's see if I can make a U drive work. Uh, open. <coughs> That's odd. Oh, that's really strange. Let's go to... Where? Why? How? You... Want a plate. going to be interesting. Okay. And I'm doing this over here. So I'll give you this function for your lab. Um, but so so for your lab, what you'll be getting out of DIC, which I'll, I'll talk about tomorrow, is you'll be getting a strain field. So generally the way it works, you have a speckle pattern of points, it tracks the displacement and stretches of those points in space, and it spits out a strain field that it gives you as data. Um, and so I wrote up a MATLAB function that I'll give to you to use for comparison for your lab, but basically you can it acts as a function. You can plug in a certain stress, some, some S0 into this thing, and what it spits out, if it wants to work. Um, it's going to get mad at me because I have an end at the end. Of course. Let's see if it works now. I'm going to do some stuff. Maybe. There. Of course it's putting it over here. On this side. Ugh. There we go. Uh, okay, so then what that looks like now? So this is uh, this is a hole. Uh, so this is your circular hole. Um, this is now the strain concentration, which is slightly different than the stress concentration. For an applied stress of whatever you put in. It'll then, if you plug in certain E and sig certain uh, sigmas, it'll spit out different strain concentrations. Uh, but this is stress in the x direction. You see here that there's about um, what is that? Like twenty strain millimeter, twenty eight ish, the root of the hole. Um, and then if you look at the strain in the y direction, you're getting uh, orthogonal to that about a negative ten. So. There's a negative 10 here and about a positive 30 on the other, in the other one. So if you're, th if you're thinking now, remember, we're, we're pulling a plate sideways. Um, the stress at the top and bottom should be the highest, and it should be about a factor of three. Uh, and the stress here at the side should be about a factor of negative one. So that we're seeing, there's that negative one here on the side, 
And there's a positive 30 or a positive 3 here at the top and bottom. And that's kind of what the, the strain field looks like. The stress field is different. You can play around with the MATLAB function to, to take a look at what those different strain fields look like. I'll, I'll post it to Canvas uh, hopefully sometime today when, along with the lab. Um, but yeah, so this is now what, what the stress concentration generally looks like around a hole. But um, that's a little bit complicated to look at and a little bit complicated to think about. So instead we just <coughs> look at wherever it is here. It's, this is a little bit easier to conceptualize the, the stress along certain lines away from the root. Um, and again here, this is a minus sigma infinity and it decays to zero. This is a plus three sigma infinity and it decays to sigma naught. Sigma infinity. Um, cool. So there's a couple notes about this that I wanted to bring up. Uh, a few things to consider. So this is a general formula, uh, a general derivation for a certain applied sigma naught. So if I instead have a compressed plate with a hole, so now this is being compressed by some sigma naught. I want to look at the stress concentrations around here. Um, at the top, so I, I'm going to call this negative. I'm going to use the, again, I'm, I'm mixing up the directions, but just take the, the, the magnitude of the stress, or the, the, the stress is, a, is negative because it's compressive. Here at, at the top and bottom corners of this thing, this is now negative 3 sigma negative 3 sigma um, and here at the right and left side this is some sigma naught so now if I'm if I'm compressing a plate I'm actually getting some tensile stress orthogonal and I'm getting a higher compressive stress you can also so I don't think I've actually talked about this explicitly but there's um, so this is a, a small strain linear elastic solution this is another kind of important consideration to make when we're doing this lab report. Um, because this is only valid for, again, when we're deflecting it a little bit and when there's no plasticity uh, and when uh, I have a linear elastic homogeneous material. Um, but when you have that case, when you have that linear elastic deformation, there's a principle, there, there's the principle of superposition. So that means if I take two stress states, uh, I can just add up their result and I get the final <coughs> stress state. So I get I can add up their results individually and I can get I can take that sum to be the final stress state. So what that looks like for a plate with a hole, um, if I do now biaxial stress hole. Uh, okay. Um, now again I have a, a plate that's large relative to my hole size and I stress it in both directions, in both the x and the y directions. And I want to look at what the stress at a given point is. I'm going to call these sigma naughts. This is an equal biaxial stress hole in a plate. Um, the stress here from the stress in the x direction now is a three sigma naught. The stress here from the stress in the other direction is a minus sigma naught. So the stress actually ends up being two <coughs> sigma naught. Um, and it's two sigma naught now everywhere around the hole, or at, at these four corners around the hole. Two sigma naught, two sigma naught. So actually there's a slightly reduced stress concentration here when you're doing a biaxial stress because the effect of these stresses in the opposite direction actually counter each other. The stress field now, if you wanted to look at, you could basically add one stress rotated 90 degrees with the other one and get a slightly more complicated stress distribution around the thing. But 
um, the important points, the important stress concentration points that we want to look at are here at the root of the hole, and we actually get a somewhat more uniform stress. Um, there's another example now that I think uh, we can probably leave on uh, after this, but um, so if I have now instead I'm going to pull up another sheet. Uh, if I have now an elliptical hole in a plate, uh, this is being stressed out of infinity. And I have, this is supposed to be an ellipse, it's not, it's sort of elliptical. Um, this is some 2b, this is some 2a. Uh, now the stress concentration around that hole, again, is going to be the highest here at that point at the top. What that stress max is actually going to be, is our sigma naught, uh, 1 plus 2b over a. So um, this is specifically at top of the list, because um, again, here I would have a higher stress concentration. When this isn't elliptical at all, when b is equal to a, this goes to 1, and I get my 3 sigma naught stress concentration. But importantly, as um, a as a becomes much smaller than b, as a sort of goes to 0, um, then my sigma max starts going to infinity, because this term becomes infinitely large. So now if I have a very, very sharp crack, if I had something in a block that looked like that with a very, very high aspect ratio, the, the stress concentration here at the root of the ellipse is very, very high. So that would mean for it, basically for any material, if I, if I drew a if I took a razor, basically, and I and I cut a scratch in that hole, uh, or I, and I cut a scratch in the material, there'd be a huge, huge stress, stress concentration. And if I pulled it at all, it would just kind of tear through the material immediately. The reason that isn't the case is because we have plasticity. So plasticity will then start to cause deformation local to the tip, um, and it'll sort of reduce that stress concentration uh, plastically. If you have a very brittle material, that isn't always the case. So if you remember before <clears throat> when, I, when I mentioned brittle materials fail via tension, this is why. Because if I have a tiny crack with a small, even, even, a, even a very small crack with a high aspect ratio, a, a small skinny crack, it's going to cause a huge, huge stress concentration of the material. And if there's no plasticity mechanisms microstructurally, if there's no dislocations or grain boundary siding that can happen around the notch, um, then that'll just cause it to shoot straight through the material. Um, you never have an atomistic, or very rarely, it's not really practical to have an atomistically sharp crack. Um, so you never actually have an infinite stress concentration, but you can have very high stress concentrations that if they aren't alleviated plastically will, will cause failure pretty easily. Um, that's probably <clears throat> a good point to stop at. So tomorrow again we'll talk about stress concentration or uh, digital image correlation. I'll go through some of the background of that uh, and then I'll talk about the DIC lab that you'll be doing this week. But basically you'll be looking at a strip of rubber with a hole in it and you'll be looking at these strain concentration maps around that hole. Yeah.